Hello, my name is Dr. Katrina Cornish and I'll be talking to you today about rubber production in the, in the world today. 42% of all the rubber we use is natural rubber, which means that it comes from plants. The rest comes from petroleum, which is a non-sustainable version, uh, non version of rubber. Now, where does our natural rubber come from? At the moment, it all comes from the tropical rubber tree. And where is that? Well, it originated in the Amazon. This is the Brazilian rubber tree. But hardly any rubber comes from there now, maybe about 3%. And this is because of fatal fungal diseases. And we're very worried in the world that these diseases might spread to the other rubber producing areas. Now, Africa has a fair amount of rubber, but it's not produced very efficiently, and they only contribute about 5% of the supply. So really, the area we care about is Asia. 92% of all the rubber comes from Southeast Asia. These are countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, India, and now China is becoming a significant producer. But you need a tropical region. Now, if we look in the Northern Hemisphere, we look at North America, which includes us, Europe, which includes my folks, there's no rubber. All of this has to be imported. And between Ohio, where we are now, and Malaysia, this is a 12-hour time difference. So this all gets put on a boat and brought all the way over here. So this is not a very good scenario. Also, as these countries are rapidly developing, you're looking at Brazil, Africa as a continent, India, China, these people all want more rubber because rubber is ubiquitous in modern life. 70% goes to tires. So we in the US import 1.2 million metric tons a year. The shortfalls projected for just a few years ahead are greater than the entire amount that we import. So where are we going to get our rubber from? This is a picture of a plantation of the Havea rubber tree. This is grown a few feet apart as clones on seedling rootstocks. So for as far as the eye can see, for miles and miles and miles, it's genetically identical material. This means it's extremely prone to crop failure. They struggle with fungal diseases all the time. And if the South American leaf blight makes it to Southeast Asia, we could lose our entire production in one or two years. Now, as I said, modern life is dependent. And this is largely because of high performance properties that natural rubber has. The higher the performance of a tire, the greater the percentage of natural rubber. An airplane tire is 100% natural rubber. It can't land if there's any synthetic in there without blowing up. A regular car tire is about 50%. The trucks you see are 90 to 100% natural, and the big earth moving tires, tractor tires, they're 100% natural. You can't make it, can't make those materials with something that, from synthetics. Now, it is of course essential to the economy and national defense. You can't have a wall without natural rubber. Even a tank has half a ton in it. Um, and as I say, 1.2 million. This is a $50 billion industry in the US. The global industry is about $200 billion. There is a cartel, so maybe they'll get their act together one day and have a proper OREC equivalent. Um, and as I said, automotive and tires. Now, this tree is tapped by hand this enormous market, and this is how it's done. Literally, you have rubber tappers like this. This one's got a lamp in his hat. They go out in the pre-dawn hours and tap when the latex yields are greatest. And they collect through this tapping panel this rubber latex in a little cup. So this is a better picture of it dripping into these cups. And then this poor guy goes down, tips the cups into his bucket, so he walks down to the tree line and then puts them into something larger. And it's then taken to a manufacturing plant that either dewaters it to make concentrate, which will go to the latex dipping industry, or it's coagulated in one of various methods. And that's what you tend to make things like tires out of. Now, how much is this really? So we have 12 million metric tons globally of natural rubber and we have 1.2 coming into the States. So I calculated this out in grown male African elephant equivalents. So you get some concept of what this actually is. So at the moment, the global supply is about 11 of these a minute tapped in that little cup. You're collected in that little cup by hand. Now by 2030, we're supposed to have a tripling, nearly a tripling in demand 
and that's 28 elephants a minute. Now the immediate need that we already know in six years, and it takes six or seven years to, for a tree to become tappable, we have to destroy nearly 33,000 square miles of rainforest for new plantings. And this is to meet 2022 demand. Now this acreage is the size of South Carolina or Austria. And this is cutting down rainforest in one of the few areas of biodiversity that we have left to us. So this is clearly an unacceptable scenario. The World Wildlife Fund has, has support, is supporting a moratorium on new Havea plantations. Now, also, if we start in the bioeconomy moving towards replacing synthetic rubber with natural rubber through chemical modifications and things of this nature, this could double again. And this could end up being an African elephant a second tapped into that little cup and with massive ecological destruction going with that. So alternatives are essential. We have to make our rubber from something else as well. And this is Wayuli, which is a desert shrub from the Chihuahuan Desert of Mexico and Texas. And this is the dandelion. Now, this is a semi-arid shrub. It makes beautiful rubber, beautiful latex, but we're in Ohio. Ohio has a lot of rain. This guy does not like a lot of rain. But this one comes from Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. It likes the snow, it likes the rain. We can grow this in Ohio. So it's, this is the one that we're developing as a crop in this state. Now there's 50,000 different products made with natural rubber from tires, balloons, tubing, there's just a very few of them being shown here. This little guy is an artist balloon, animal balloon, and uh, that is the first actual animal balloon ever made from Wayuli latex in the history of the world. Now if you're going to actually accomplish making a new crop it's very complicated. This is, you have to have coordination from plant to product to do this. If you're going to make a new product out of something like corn, you can just call up a train load. You know, it's already there, the same for soybeans. But if you want to make something out of a new rubber from an alternate crop, you've got to grow it first. So we've got a big program in germplasm improvement you have to also be able to grow it in the field. Weed control and irrigation are the biggies here. We need to have farmers, growers, who are actually going to grow it. There's only so much you can put on, a, on an experiment farm. And you have to, how are you going to look after it post-harvest? What is the logistics of getting it from the field to the process? So here you need to have a robust process. We're emphasizing 100% crop production, valorizing every piece, and then you have the factory. This post harvest has to be delivered to the factory, processed here. This can produce then latex and rubber and also the gas, the rest of the plant. So what are you going to do with that? And then what are your co-products? How can you valorize this to have your co-products? Your latex and rubber. Rubber is not the same. There's 2,500 plants we know make it. They all have differences in their composition, differences in the macromolecular structure. So the same compounding recipe isn't going to give you the same result in every different species of rubber that you might extract. Most of them are not high quality. So you have to develop all of that process so you can make high quality products. Down here we've got products and fuels from the co-product materials. Then these have to be marketed and sale. We have, you have to have customers. And then only then can you do expansion. Now, if we're looking at tires, how many acres would you need to be meaningful to introduce a new tire line? Well, hundreds of thousands at least. And then where's your processing plants for producing hundreds of thousands of uh, extracting hundreds of thousands of tires? So you have to have something. What are you going to do with 10 acres? What are you going to do with 100 acres? What is this rubber going to go, go toward? Because if you don't scale processing, sales, and production together, uh, this, just, this does not succeed. However, it is a nice plant. It's ecologically uh, benign. We have a very happy bee on one of our dandelions. This is at our experimental farm here. And then we can do it by transplants. This is before the polar vortex winter. You see, half of the plants did survive. This is the seed crop the following year. 
This, though, was the direct seeded crop on a commercial farm last year. And then down here, the big problem, as I say, is weeds. If you don't weed, this is what you end up with. No dandelions and just lots of weeds because they swamp, the, they swamp this new crop, which isn't vigorous enough to compete against them. So the big challenge is how do you kill the dandelions without killing the dandelions? All right, so now that we've gone through this background of what our main issues are to establish a domestic rubber crop in the US, the rest of the class is going to be walking you through parts of that jigsaw I showed a couple of slides ago, showing you examples of how you actually, where rubber comes from with this plant, how you quantify it and how you then turn it into uh, rubber products.